Okay, hello and happy Saturday, everyone. So I wanted to just say a great thank you to all of our sponsors. And I'm so thrilled to have with us here, Maria, and she was speaking about information leakage. I will sign off and she will take it away. Hi, thank you for joining me today. My name is Maria Gerardo and a little something about me. I'm a PhD student at the Florida International University in Miami. I study computer science and specifically I study leakage. I've been doing this for the last four years. So let's go ahead and just jump right in. So I'm sure many of you have heard about Strava, a social fitness app with a great GPS heat map. This heat map was so good that it revealed the location of suspected military sites. I'll walk through how this happened really quickly. So here we have a heat map corresponding to the running and swimming routes of people using the Strava Fitness app, which is often used with Fitbits. I've taken the liberty of outlining Afghanistan in purple, and we can see just a few small dots here and there. Everything is, else is so dark that these like really stand out. So what happens when we zoom in on this dot right here? We see Camp Dwyer, a U.S. forward operating base in Afghanistan. And with the satellite view, we can zoom in and see the individual rotors of the planes. So although the exact coordinates of the base and airport are available on Wikipedia, this base will not show up in Google or Apple Maps. So the Strava heat map is an intuitive example of information leakage. Revealing something fun, like the common running paths in your neighborhood, also reveal the locations of sensitive military bases. The key word here is correlation. Okay, but to make things more complicated, sometimes we reveal information on purpose. Consider a vulnerability in a system. A company finds out about the vulnerability. What do they do next if they're responsible? They develop a patch and push it to all of the vulnerable systems. And what do we do as users? Update next week, again and again, or maybe we're sysadmins and we're concerned that it'll break something else, and so we wait. So the patch doesn't get applied. You know who was paying attention to the patch release? Attackers. Some patch releases tell them that there's a crucial vulnerability somewhere, and sometimes with the help of some reverse engineering, tells them how to exploit it. A patch represents information that we want people to know. And even though it's intentional information release, it still helps an attacker. So we can see that information is like water. It's hard to control. So we have two different definitions here. The first one is information flow, which we define as information moving from a source who knows the information to a target who doesn't. And some information flow is unintentional, unavoidable, or inevitable. And sometimes it gets to who we want it to get to, and sometimes it doesn't. But what we want is to control it, to make sure that it gets to who we want to have it and keep it from those who we don't. So what's leakage then? Information leakage is when observable information can be correlated with a secret. Information flows from a secret to something observable, and we have to ask if that flow is acceptable. So for both of these examples, we have the feeling that they're bad somehow, but we would like to know how bad. So today, I want you to come away knowing a simple framework for thinking about leakage, knowing how you can cal calculate information leakage and what goes into this calculation and that you can apply this framework to relevant problems to compare systems, reason about trade-offs between security and functionality, and reduce your attack surface. Before we dive in, let's get some very, let's get some history here and look at a brief academic timeline. Okay, so modern information flow security work starts in the 1970s, when Bell and Lepodula, who were working for MITRE, devised an access control model for classified information. So simply, the idea was to protect classified secrets by ensuring that those who know a higher classification of data can't reveal what they know by writing it to people who don't, and those who know less shouldn't learn the secret information by reading it, <clears throat> or write up, read down. A decade later, this principle becomes codified in the concept of non-interference, which means that the public output of a program shouldn't tell you anything about the secret input. But the requirements to meet non-interference were really strict. The idea was that if the output had any dependence on the secret at all, that the secret was unsafe. The system was unsafe. But you can think about vote counts for a second. The vote tally tells you who won the office. And this is directly dependent on the secret vote. So in this case, it's necessary to be dependent on the secret. 
So in the 90s, researchers decided that the earlier requirements on dependence were too strict. There are trade-offs that we need to make between security and function. And to evaluate these systems, we need to move past the binary and move to a nuanced understanding with the ability to evaluate tolerable insecurity. For example, we want to make informed policy decisions based on statistical databases without hurting privacy. And these are real trade-offs that we have to evaluate. So at this point, the question shifted to how much does information flow? Early attempts to answer this question relied on concepts borrowed from information theory, like mutual information and Shannon entropy. The problem was that these measurements didn't provide an operational significance. They didn't really reflect how vulnerable a secret was to a given attack. So in the 2000s, the argument was made that there are better measures, like min entropy, that reflect how vulnerable a secret is to a particular attack. And with measures like these, we're able to meaningfully compare systems. And just last year, some of the top academics in the space collected all of their theories and unified their notation into a textbook reflecting the state of the art called the Qu Science of Quantitative Information Flow. And it's from this work that I'm going to talk about today. Quantitative information flow, or QIF, models a system as a channel that takes in a secret input and outputs something observable. So secrets can be anything that we would like to keep secret, from medical diagnosis, PII, passwords, votes, salaries, encrypted messages. Observable outputs are anything that an adversary can observe that's correlated with the secret. So when we hear about an email leak, this is a blatant example of leakage. The observable output is the secret itself. But there are more subtle leaks, information that's not obviously correlated with the secret, but can still help an adversary, like side channels from heat, time, and electrical consumption. So there's this flow here from secrets to observable information, and we want to quantify this flow to decide if the flow is dangerous or tolerable. Okay, so I won't go into a lot of detail on this today, but QIF does integrate adversarial goals and constraints, which allow us to mathematically formalize threat modeling. So some questions that we can model with QIF are, what are an adversary's goals? Do they want to know the secret exactly, or are they satisfied with knowing it approximately? What are an adversary's abilities and constraints? Do they have multiple chances? What are their limitations? What's the cost to an adversary? Will they be penalized for guessing wrong? Do they win more if they guess about a particular secret, like Jeff Bezos' account number? OK, so let's return to this Java example and see how it fits within the QIF model. So here the secret input is the location of a US forward operating base, and the observable output is a heat map showing running paths. So as shown by Nathan Russer back in 2018, this was enough information to reveal the base location, as well as other theorized safe houses and other nation's military bases. Similarly, for the patching example, the secret input is the existence of a vulnerability, and the observable output is a patch. Sometimes the patch does give an attacker enough information to learn about and exploit the vulnerability. OK, so now we know the QIF model of information flow, and we can start measuring leakage. Our goal here is to isolate the effect of the channel to determine how it affected the vulnerability of our secret. <clears throat> Using QIF means we don't have to rely on our intuition to tell us how bad something is. So let's start with a high-level overview. <clears throat> we have two measurements that we use to isolate the effect of the system. The first is prior vulnerability, which is an adversary's probability of succeeding at a given task when they only know the distribution on the secrets. So the attacker hasn't observed anything yet. The second measure is posterior vulnerability, which is an adversary's probability of success when they know the distribution on the secrets and can observe the output. An important point here is that there are generally many outputs that an adversary can observe, and we would like to account for all of them. So you can think about an output as something that lets the adversary narrow down what the secret is. Different outputs let the adversary narrow down the secret in different ways, which we need to account for. OK, so functionally, we can think of posterior vulnerability as a weighted average of how likely an adversary is to succeed when they can observe the correlated output. So we're thinking about these two terms. Prior vulnerability is basically how well an attacker would do if they're sitting at their desk, 
planning out their attack while posterior vulnerability is the average of how they do once they launch their attack and can actually see what's going on. So with these two, we actually want to calculate how much the secret, the system increased or decreased the secret's vulnerability. So we define leakage as the difference between prior and posterior vulnerability. And this is how we can isolate how a system affects a secret input. Let's go through an example. So you're in charge of buying the locks for a new warehouse. Should you get the traditional keypad lock with the buttons or the fancy one with the flat touch screen that costs $30 more? So to model this under the QIF framework, we first need to identify what our secret is. In this case, we know it's gonna be a four digit code that opens the door. We can also identify our, ad our adversary. And so for now, we're co we'll consider what we call a Bayes adversary which corresponds to somebody who's guessing the entire secret correctly in one try. This adversary is a good place to start. It's simple, it's operationally significant, and it has the advantage of being related to other leakage measures. It's also ambitious. There are a lot of cases when we're concerned about adversaries who are satisfied with a lot less, and we'll consider one of those weaker adversaries later on. Okay, so let's look at the exact steps we need to calculate Bayes leakage. Here's our algorithm, a recipe. We'll walk through these steps one by one, but for the moment, keep in mind that to calculate leakage, we need the prior vulnerability and the posterior vulnerability highlighted in green. Let's start with the first step. So the QIF framework makes the worst case assumption that an adversary knows the distribution on secrets and uses this to inform their decisions. So we need to find a distribution that corresponds to our secret. For some secrets, we can make the assumption that all secrets are uniformly likely, but we know for key codes that this isn't the case. Some of our 10,000 possible key codes are much more likely than others. Thankfully, kind of, there's a lot of data breaches with this information. For example, there's the Rocky data set. They made widgets back for MySpace back in the day, and in 2008, 32 million user accounts stored in plain text got breached. This data contained 28 million key codes, and this nice page on GitHub has the key code frequencies from which we can get the distribution on the secrets. So here's a graph representing that information. And so now we have the distribution on our secrets. Step one, complete. Now what? Step two, determine the prior vulnerability by picking the most likely secret from the distribution. Okay, so let's go back to our distribution. To understand prior vulnerability, you can think about an adversary who's sitting at home, they're not at the warehouse yet, they're just prepping for the heist. They went online and also saw this distribution. If they're trying to guess your key code, what do they do? Well, we can see from this graph that there are three codes that are much more likely than the other 10,000. One, two, three, four has over a 2% probability and then two, three, four, five, and then three, four, five, six. We're gonna assume that a smart adversary guessing the secret will pick the most likely one. So our thief should guess the most likely code, one, two, three, four, and they'll be right just under 2.5% of the time. This is the prior base vulnerability. Okay, so now we have the first measure done. On to step three, outputs. We haven't even talked about outputs yet. What's the output? Let's start there. So while we're looking up keypads, we go online and see this picture from a Bruce Schneier blog back in 2009. Uh-oh, okay, so if we use the keypad enough, the keys can get worn down. How bad is this? Well, in the picture, the numbers worn down are one, six, eight, and nine. Well, now the adversary doesn't have 10,000 candidates for the key code, they only have 24. But this is only one set of keys that could get worn down. If the admin at the site chooses a different password, then different keys could get worn down over time. So if four, six, and seven are worn down, then our attacker has 36 candidates for the secret. If, for example, two and five are worn down, then our adversary has to pick between 14 codes. Mm -hmm. And if only the three is worn down, then the adversary knows for sure that the secret code was 3333. There's a lot of possible observations that an adversary can, can make from this information. In fact, there are 385 possible combinations of keys that could get worn down for a four digit code, and we would like to account for all of them. 
So now we've defined our input and output in the QIF model. The secret is a four digit code and the observable output is worn numbers. The button keypad acts as a channel that allows information to flow from the secret input to the observable output. Is this an acceptable flow? How bad is this really? So now that we've defined our outputs, for every possible output, remember there are 385, we need to do the following steps. Isolate the secrets that could produce the output, sum their probabilities and get the probability of that output, normalize these probabilities, and pick the most likely one. And so we'll go through this step by step, but basically for every output, we want two numbers, the probability of the output, or PO, and the probability of success given that output, or PS. So let's talk about what these two numbers mean. So the first number we need is the probability of the output. How likely is that set of numbers going to be worn down relative to all the other possibilities? So a first guess is one in 385, since there are 385 possible outputs. But we know from the RockyU data set that passcodes are equally likely, so numbers won't get worn down uniformly either. So we need to integrate that RockU passcode distribution information. The second number that we need is the probability of success given that output. For example, if an adversary does see that this set of numbers are worn down, the one, six, eight, and nine, what's the chance the adversary will be able to guess the passcode? For this guess, I mean, a first a, well, for this case, a good first guess is one in 24, since there's 24 ways to pick a four digit passcode from these four numbers. But again, that would be the case if all passcodes were equally likely, and we know that's not the case. So we have to integrate that distribution information. So I've done the work for us, and I'll show you the results in a minute with Python, uh, not by hand, <laughs> but I do wanna walk through these how we get these two numbers just for the one, six, eight, and nine case. So we get a little bit more intuition. Okay, step 3.1. Remember, we're dealing with the one, six, eight, and nine case. Okay, isolate the secrets that could produce this output. We kind of already did this. We know there are 24 codes that could result with one, six, eight, and nine being worn down. That's a lot less than 10,000. So already our adversary is in a much better position. Now what? We need to integrate that passcode distribution. Step 3.2, sum the probabilities. So let's go back to the chart representing the distribution of passcodes from the RockU data breach. So we know that when the keys one, six, eight, and nine are worn off, the secret must be one of these 24 codes. And I've highlighted these 24 codes in purple. It's really tiny and at the bottom, it's kind of hard to see. To get the probability of this output of one, six, eight, and nine being worn down, we need to add the probabilities of these 24 possible secrets together. And when we do that, we get 0 0.003592. This means that the adversary will see one, six, eight, and nine worn down about 0.3% of the time. That's useful. That's the first number that we need to calculate for this output. But beyond this, we can't really see what's going on. The numbers are so small and spread out. So now what we can do is step 3.3. We can normalize these purple dot numbers, which means we're gonna think about these 24 secrets as if there are only options. The idea here is that we wanna see their relative probabilities a little more clearly. So here are all of our 24 candidates and only our 24 candidates. Now we're not looking at how likely they are to all of the original 10,000 possibilities, but instead we're just looking at how relatively li likely they are to each other. From this, we can see that one code is far more likely than the rest. 1986. 1986 is far more likely than any of the other passcodes. This means that when the adversary sees one, six, eight, and nine, they'll guess that the secret passcode was 1986 and they'll be right 38% of the time. So now we've calculated our two numbers for this output, the probability of the output, which is 0.3% from the earlier slide, and the probability of success given this output, which is 38%. Okay, so let's go back to our algorithm. 
For the one, six, eight, and nine output, we've completed all the sub steps. We isolated the secrets. We sum their probabilities to get the probability of the output. We normalize these probabilities to pick the most likely one and get the probability that the adversary succeeds if they see one, six, eight, and nine worn down. But the steps need to be done for all of the outputs so we can sum them up to get our posterior vulnerability. Two numbers for 385 outputs. Okay. Well, here they are. And I know it's a lot. You don't have to look at every single number. We'll kind of walk through it first. So these are sorted by the worn down keys. Um, and I know that they're hard to see, but here are the cases when only a single key is worn down, uh, zero through nine. And here are all of the cases when two keys are worn down and when three keys are worn down and when the four keys are worn down. The one, six, eight, and nine case is right here in green in the seventh column. We can't really see what's going on from the numbers alone. Remember there are two numbers listed here for every set of keys that could get worn down. So we're gonna graph it. Okay, this feels better. Take a second to orient yourself here because now we're looking at our 385 outputs in a different way. We're seeing a visual representation of those two numbers. So here, the size of the square indicates the probability of the output, that the adversary sees that sets of numbers worn off. So we can see that the really big squares, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 3, and 0, 1, 9 are some of the most likely keys that are going to be worn down. The color of the box corresponds to the adversary's probability of success if they see that output. So the more purple, the more likely the adversary is to guess the passcode correctly on the first try. So let's orient ourselves with this a little bit better and start to walk through some of these outputs. Let's start with the case that we did by hand, the one, six, eight, and nine case. It is right here. You can see that it's relatively more likely to be the output the adversary sees at, at 0.3% because there's definitely some smaller boxes that the adversary is much less likely to see. Given this output, the adversary will guess that the secret code is 1986, and they'll be right 38% of the time, giving this box this teal color. Okay, so let's look at a few other outputs. If we go back to our main graph, we can see these bright purple boxes. It turns out that they correspond to seeing only one key worn down. For example, this is the case when the adversary sees that only one key, the one, is worn down. If only this one key is worn down, the adversary will guess that the passcode is 1111 and they'll be correct 100% of the time, according to our model. The most likely thing that the adversary will see, however, is that one, two, three, and four are worn down. And this corresponds to this large purple box in the bottom left. The adversary will see keys one, two, and three, one, two, three, and four worn down almost 3% of the time, which is relatively a lot. And when they see these keys worn down, the adversary will be super confident that the code was one, two, three, four with a really, really high probability of 86%. This is going to drag our average, our posterior vulnerability up. So what is our posterior vulnerability? It's a weighted average of these two numbers for all outputs. You can think about posterior vulnerability as a single number that summarizes this entire chart. We weigh the adversary's probability of success, or the color of the square, with the probability of the output, or the size of the square. We add them all up, and we get the posterior Bayes vulnerability, which is at around 0.2 or 20%. If you prefer to see the full equation, we can return to the numbers that we saw before, and we can see that we weigh them together by multiplying them, and then we add them to get the average. And the result of this is 0.2047, or 20%. The output that we calculated by hand is right here, highlighted in green in the seventh column, and these numbers get added to the final posterior vulnerability. So now we have our posterior vulnerability. And now we can talk about the L word. 
leakage. The point of calculating the leakage is to isolate the effect of the channel. Where did we start and where did we end up? Are we in a slightly worse position or a much worse one? So we can see from the right here that we started off with a 2% vulnerability and we ended with a 20% vulnerability. So we can compare prior and posterior vulnerability by dividing to get the relative difference. If we divide 20% by 2%, we see that this worn down keypad channel increased our secrets vulnerability by almost tenfold. We can also compare the vulnerabilities by subtracting to get the absolute difference. So in this case, 20% minus 2% is 18%. And so the channel in increased an adversary's probability of success in absolute terms by 18 points. So what can we say from all of this? Without the worn keys, an adversary can guess the code 2% of the time. If they can see the worn down keys, they'll succeed 20% of the time. 20% is pretty high a one in five chance. And so as the person deciding on the keypads, you may wanna avoid this and just pay the extra $30 for the touchscreen. So now we've gone over how to exactly calculate leakage and how to use this information to inform our decisions. But we aren't limited to small examples. We can also use this framework to address pressing security questions and to evaluate state-of-the-art cryptography. In fact, I just presented this work at an academic security conference last month in which we looked at order revealing encryption or ORE. So the motivation behind ORE comes from our desire to store sensitive data while also being able to search and sort the data quickly. We can't store it in plain text because of data breaches and we can't use traditional encryption because the ciphertext from traditional encryption look like junk and will prevent us from searching and sorting. So in response, specialized cryptography has been developed that encrypts the data while also revealing some property of the plain text. So we can use our database functions. Order revealing encryption reveals only the order so that the server can answer queries without having to decrypt you can think about this like as a type of homomorphic encryption since we're evaluating something over encrypted data. I'll walk through how this works. You can think of three entities, a database admin, a trusted proxy, and an untrusted server. The idea is that a database, database admin will insert a record like an employee named Maria Garcia who earns $28 an hour. The proxy encrypts this record using ORE and sends this entry to the server. And you can see this N6 blah, 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 seemingly random value. And it looks like junk, but it has special properties. So to query, the admin will send their request to the proxy. Say they want all employees who are making between $25 and $30 an hour. The proxy will encrypt these values using ORE and submit the query to the server. At this point, magic happens. The nature of ORE ensures that the server can compare these seemingly junk values. For every entry in the database, the server will check if it falls within the range given to it by the proxy and it'll return the correct records. As an Im implementation note, we wouldn't want the server to return just one record since it would break some privacy properties, but this is just an example. So the proxy will decrypt the record and return the plain text to the admin. So at no point during this process does the server have access to the sensitive secret data. It can only test for order if a value is less than, equal to, or greater than another value. This type of solution represents the exact type of trade-off that we've been discussing between security and functionality. Some information is intentionally revealed in exchange for searching and sorting. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, is it worth it and under what conditions? We can begin to answer this question through the application of QIF. So in this work, we analyzed two variations of ORE. The first is ideal ORE. Ideally, no information about the plain text should be observable by the adversary except the underlying order of the plain text, which allows the server to perform range queries and sorting. 
So in the QIF model, the secret is a plain text column of numeric values, and the output is ordered indices. So in this example, let's say we have this column of hourly rates for employees. All the adversary or server should be able to deduce about this column is that whatever is at indices one and three are equal and less than whatever is at index two, which is less than the contents at index four. And like in the keypad example, this is just one of the possible inputs and outputs that an adversary could observe. And just like in the keypad example, when we calculate prior and posterior vulnerability, we're going to want to address all possible inputs and outputs. OK, but it's at this point that we come up against a problem. It seems like a deal ORE is difficult to implement efficiently. It relies on some fancy cryptographic primitives that we're not sure about the security of. They're just expensive to run. They take a long time. It's just not efficient. And so cryptographers have developed a scheme that is efficiently implementable, but maybe leaks a little bit more. So it's named CLWW ORE after the authors. And the scheme reveals order. I mean, that's the whole point. You need order to do querying. But it also reveals a tiny bit more of information, just the index of the most significant differing bit. So you do not have to remember how binary works to walk through this example with me. But if we represent 20 in binary, it looks like this, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. And if we represent 28 in binary, it looks like this, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. So from here, let's label the bit positions from the right from B1 through B7. So what CLWW ORE wants to do is to determine order, right? So starting from the left, both numbers have zeros, more zeros, and then ones. But at position before, the number 20 has a zero and 28 has a one. Functionally, this means that 28 is larger than 20. They were the same up to this point, but now it's clear that the 28 is larger. So we're going to write a four here because our column contents at indices one and three are smaller than whatever is at index two. And the first differing bit that reveals this is at position B4. So let's move on to the next number. Uh, here's the binary representation of 120. It's one, 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 zero, zero, zero. Compared to 28, the two numbers differ immediately at position B7. One number is greater than 64 while the number isn't. So between 28 and 120, the index of the first significant differing bit from the left is at index seven. So we write a seven here, indicating that whatever is at index two is less than the contents at index four, and they first differ at position B7. And so this makes our most significant differing bit profile. So returning to our QIF model, the input for CLWW ORE is the same. It's a plain text column. But in contrast, instead of just revealing the order, the adversary can see the index of the most significant differing bit between the blocks. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, is this CLWW ORE version that bad? Is revealing the most significant differing bit information that much worse? Does it put our secret in any real risk or are its effects negligible? So let's start to build up some intuition here. What can this added most significant differing bit information do? Well, let's start with the ideal ORE output that only tells you the order of the column indices. OK, so from an adversary's perspective or whoever breached the server, they'll see that the contents at index 1 and 3 are equal, less than whatever's at index 2, and less than the contents at index 4. So from this observable output, they could guess that the secret column is this, uh, 125, 126, 125, and 127. This is a perfectly legitimate guess since it would produce the same output. Everything is in the right order. The adversary could also guess 11, 50, 11, and 65. This is also a fine guess. The output is also the same. Since the contents are ordered in the right way, this could be the secret column. But under CLWW, the observable output has this additional information of the most significant differing bit. 
So now the adversary knows that they're looking for a column which matches this profile. So can the adversary guess 125, 126, 125, and 127 now? Oops, sorry. Um, no. This column has a different, most significant differing bit profile. This isn't an acceptable candidate anymore. Can the adversary guess 11, 50, 11, and 65? Nope. No, again, it has a different profile, and so it cannot be the secret. So what's the effect of this most significant differing bit information? It helps the adversary by reducing the possible secrets, making it easier for them to guess the right one. So let's see how much it could help. With a seven bit secret and only four people in the database, only four, the adversary has over 268 million possibilities of guessing everyone's salary. When they can see the example order from ideal ORE, the possibilities get reduced down to one thousandth of the original 268 million. So now the adversary only has 341,000 possibilities to guess from. Okay, this is pretty bad, but when an adversary can also see that the most significant differing bit between these order numbers is four and seven, another 300,000 possibilities get thrown out. Candidate salary combinations are now just one ten thousandth of the original possibilities. So, and this isn't even to scale. Like you wouldn't be able to see the original, like the 32,000 if the original 268 million was fully represented. The intuition here then is that the added most significant differing bit info vastly reduces the possible secrets, making the adversary's job much, much easier. Okay, so keep in mind that this is just the secret input and output pair is just an example. Eventually, we're going to want to take all of them to an account. Okay, so what the authors of the CLWW ORE scheme do is they describe what the adversary can see, which is a good first step. The issue of quantification, how much worse CLWW is than ideal, is a different question, which we can answer by calculating the vulnerabilities. So let's characterize our adversary. We're going to deal with what we call a bucketing adversary. And so this adversary doesn't really care about guessing every salary down to the last penny, but instead they want to know what people make approximately, where the level of precision is determined by the number of buckets. I'll show you what this means. So let's say we have this graph of employee salaries in ascending order by their hourly rate. Let's say that the adversary wants to find who makes the most money so they can steal from them. And so there are three buckets the adversary wants to put everyone into. A poor bucket, an okay bucket, and a rich bucket. A successful adversary will, by only seeing the output, be able to correctly determine which bucket everyone falls into. They'll be able to see that they shouldn't try to steal from Taylor, Elena, or Maria, but and should instead go for Jose, or Rob, or Tyra. So let's cut to the chase. CLWWORE does a lot worse under this adversary. So this graph shows what happens when we encrypt the data of a thousand people with numeric values ranging from zero to 1023, indicating a 10 bit secret. The X axis reflects the number of buckets. And there's this cool property here where the number of buckets corresponds to guessing the first bits of the secret. So you can see at the bottom left, far bottom left, with two to the 10 number of buckets. This corresponds to an adversary wishing to guess all the 10 bits, and then the first nine bits, and then the first eight bits, and so on. And so if we look at the green ideal ORE line, we can see that the vulnerability of the secret is really small consistently. It's only when the adversary wants to know if the secret is in the top half or the bottom half do they have any type of success. But the results for CLWW ORE are absolutely devastating. An adversary guessing only the first seven bits of the value will succeed with probability over 97%. Seven out of the 10 bits guessed for all 1,000 people with 97% accuracy. So under a bucketing adversary, CLWW ORE is much worse than ideal. And it turns out that just a few added bits of information can be devastating. 
Okay. So now you know how to model leakage, how to calculate leakage, and how to use this process to compare systems and reduce attack surfaces. You know how to think about systems in terms of secret information and correlated observable information. You know to buy the touchscreen keypad, and you know to be wary of how one tiny bit of information may make your system much more vulnerable. So while you can apply the QIF framework to calculate leakage exactly, you can also incorporate QIF principles to help inform your system design. So going forward, I encourage uh, blue teamers and architects to use the QIF framework and take the time to answer the following questions. What is the secret that you're trying to protect? Regardless of the size or resources of your company or system, you should take the time to identify the high value information that you want to protect. We do not need to care about all of our assets to the same degree, but we should be prioritizing the security of specific high value secrets. Next, ask what can your adversary observe? What information could be correlated with your secret? You want to be as comprehensible as possible and ask yourself how this information can be leveraged to discover the secret. You can sketch this out or it can be a more thorough modeling, but remember that observable information can include things like time, logs, electricity use, header information, metadata, and notifications. Once you've identified what an attacker could observe, a good preventative measure is to disassociate this observable information from your sensitive information. For example, if you notice that a program processing some sensitive information takes longer with one put than another, you can take steps to standardize that processing time. You really just don't want to give an attacker any hints. So how in depth you go on the next questions depends on your resources since a thorough job could require higher levels of labor, computation, and expense. But the next thing you can do is threat model. Ask, what are the operational constraints of your adversary? What are their goals or sets of goals? The process of establishing the range of what an adversary would consider success could inform your system design. Lastly, after you identify your secrets, you can ask, what's the secret's probability distribution? Are they all equally likely or is one more likely than the next? Assume that an attacker knows the distribution of whatever you're trying to protect, whether passwords or salaries or PII, and given that assumption, consider how that information could help an attacker. So for example, if an attacker knows that some passwords are more common than the rest, take steps to avoid those passwords. If an attacker knows that Smith is the most common last, common last name in the US, then maybe you should not rely on your user's mother's maiden name for authentication. Depending on your security requirements and the value of the secret, this can be an extensive process where you examine auxiliary databases to determine the distribution, or it can be a back of the envelope solution where you give some passing thought on how easy it is for an adversary to achieve a certain goal if they were to have access to the distribution. If you wanna dig deeper, you can find the science of quantitative information flow from Springer, and sometimes I write about it on my blog, Spray on Security. Thank you for your time.